right. What I thought I would do is, it's been about 25 years now since epidermal growth factor was discovered. As you all know, the phenomena consisted of taking extracts of salivary gland of mice as part of our nerve growth factor study. When we injected them into newborn mice, their eyes opened up earlier and their teeth came out earlier. The purified nerve growth factor did not have that effect. When I went to Vanderbilt, I decided to study that because I felt, you can be sure, not that it was connected to oncogenes, but that anything that disturbed the timing of a developmental process was worthy of study. So there was something in the extract that made eyes open up earlier. Okay. Can I have the first slide, please? So using that eyelid opening assay as a bioassay, we were able to isolate the factor responsible for eyelid opening, and the molecule was sequenced in the old-fashioned way, and this is what it looks like. Uh, 53 amino acids, three disulfides, very stable, but most importantly, no lysines, only one amino group at the end terminal and anything you want to link up to the end terminal doesn't matter. This molecule is biologically active. So that was very useful. Okay, so now we had a small protein molecule. If you inject it into a mouse, his eyes opened up. The question was, why do eyes open up in the first place and how is this helping it? <laughs> so, on the next slide, please. So. Uh, this molecule derived from the mouse will cause eyes to open up earlier in any species. Mice, rats, puppy dogs. This is an experiment of a rat. Simply a control animal and an injected animal, eight days old. This is control animal, injected animal. This is a cross-section of the eyelid area. Eyelids cornea outside the animal. See, at eight days, eyelids are closed. Injected animal, at eight days, eyelids are open. And it is clear from this, this control animal would look like the experimental animal another week later. So it was clear from this, what was happening was the epidermal cells were growing and keratinizing faster. This was not simply an eyelid phenomenon, right? but it happened all over the animal. Next slide, please. So, for example, if you inject epidermal growth factor into a weanling animal and you wait for three weeks, and then you look at the animals, you see the injected animals have a fat tail. And if you cross-section the tail, this is the injected animal, epidermis, keratin, control animal. So, eyelid opening is simply the biological, uh, uh, biological phenomena resulting from increased epidermal growth and keratinization. The early eruption of the incisors that we saw was essentially an artifact. The teeth weren't growing faster, but the lips were differentiating faster. So you can simply pull the lip down further. It all had to do with, with skin and differentiation. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, next problem. How did this happen in simple terms? Was it acting directly on the skin cells or were we stimulating some other hormone and some more classical hormone and the second hormone was affecting the skin? Well, the key experiment was done performed with Rita during one, a sabbatical in Rome of mine. And uh, the essential finding is EGF will stimulate the growth of epidermal cells in culture. You don't need the animal. So this is now chick epidermis. This is about seven, six to seven day chick skin and this is what control epidermis looks like after two or three days in culture. You add EGF, 
This is now epidermis. From this to this. Next slide. Again, it works on any species. This is chick cornea control after four days of culture. Corneal epithelium, corneal epithelium with the factor. Human cornea embryo control, experimental. Human embryo skin in culture, control, experimental. Clearly, it affects many species, and what we see is epidermis, and hence the imaginative name, epidermal growth factor. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, now. Uh, I think Armalin was the first, we sent some of the epidermal growth factor around, to discover that at least in tissue culture, EGF made fibroblasts grow faster also. He used 3T3 cells. We repeated them with human fibroblasts in culture, and sh sure enough, this is growth curves, cell number per dish days, of human fibroblasts in culture in 10% serum and 10% serum plus a few nanograms of EGF. Or in 1% serum, control, 1% serum with a few nanograms of EGF. So in 1% serum with a few nanograms of EGF grew better than 10% serum. If you look at what the cells look like at this point, next slide please. Control fibroblasts stop growing when they're so-called contact inhibited. If you add EGF, they do not transform, but you get multi-layers of cells, presumably growing on top of each other on the collagen, causing the orientation. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now, first approach to, uh, here we had a cell system. Fibroblasts and culture, you add EGF, it makes them grow. How does it make them grow? Now we're with everybody else with a hormone. So, first step, following the endocrinologists, is to make iodinated EGF, it was biologically active. You can put fibroblasts in culture and do binding studies, and this is a human fibroblast in culture, and you can calculate that there are around 50 to 100,000 receptors per cell, uh, dissociation constants on the order of 10 to the minus 10 reasonably tight binding. Now this offered us another tool. Here we had human fibroblasts responding to mouse EGF. From all we knew, then, human fibroblasts should have receptors for EGF. If human fibroblasts have receptors for EGF, there should be an EGF-like molecule in human beings. Now we had now a new assay a radioreceptor, specific radioreceptor assay for EGF using the human fibroblasts. And uh, to look for the human counterpart of EGF, we turned to biological fluids and found that in human urine, there was a competing activity. So we isolated human EGF based on its ability to compete for receptors on fibroblasts with iodinated mouse EGF, and we were able to isolate a small peptide from human urine. Next slide, please. That was very similar to the mouse EGF, but behaved, had different electrophoretic mobility, had about the same molecular weight, amino acid composition was slightly different, but the molecule did exactly the same in all our systems as the mouse EGF. That is the human material you injected into mice, made eyes open up, cornea grow, skin grow, fibroblasts grow. So we thought we had isolated the human counterpart of mouse EGF. Now, as usual in science, unexpected things happen. Gregory in England was looking at an old activity called urogastrone in urine. This was a substance in urine which, when you inject into an animal, inhibits acid secretion. 
and we want to go cure ulcers. When he isolated from, I think, 2,000 liters of urine, a small amount of the peptide, and sequenced it. Next slide, this is Gregory's slide, I believe, and looked in the literature. The only thing it looked like was mouse EGF. So the top line in our sequence, in this sequence, is our mouse EGF, and the second line in each series is the urogastrone, as determined by Gregory. The differences are in the boxes. Everything else is the same. And uh, from all we know now, urogastrone and human EGF are the same molecules. They all do the same thing. EGF stops acid secretion. Urogastrone makes eyes open up and vice versa. Uh, this is not... I don't think anyone could find this connection by any rational means. It was only from knowing the sequence of both. Of course, even today, there is no rational connection between inhibition of acid secretion and epidermal growth. That awaits one of you students to figure out. Okay, next slide. Okay, now we're back to either mouse or human EGF. How does it make cells grow in culture? So, when you do binding a hormone to cells at zero degrees, just take a dish of fibroblasts, add iodinated EGF for different lengths of time, saturating amounts, see what happens, then wash it away and count the cells. At zero degrees, hormone binds and remains stably bound. At 37 degrees, what we observed was the hormone bound to the cell about an hour, half hour, and then the amount of cell-bound radioactivity decreased to reach a new equilibrium. This was not due to the destruction of the hormone completely, because one can take this media and repeat this experiment. One can add fresh labeled hormone to this, and you get no more binding. We finally concluded, and I'll give you a little bit of the evidence, that what was happening here was hormone was binding the receptor on the cell surface. Hormone and receptor were internalized. Hormone was degraded, loss of radioactivity. Hormone was no longer on the cell surface, so it could not bind fresh hormone. And that down-regulation in this system involved physical removal of the receptor. Now, I'll show you a bit of the evidence on which this is based. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, first, if you take fibroblasts in culture, you add iodinated the EGF at 37 degrees, then wash it away and incubate the cells, radioactivity comes off very rapidly half-life of an hour, but what comes off is iodotyrosine, completely destroyed. If you add the hormone at zero degrees, wash it away. Incubate at zero degrees, radioactivity comes off more slowly, but what comes off is intact hormone. Last experiment, if you follow. If you take the cells, add the hormone at 37 degrees, wash it away, incubate at zero degrees, nothing comes off. Our conclusion from this was that at zero degrees, the hormone stayed on the outside and can dissociate off. At 37, it went into the cell and was destroyed. If we bound at 37, it went into the cell, you put it at zero degrees, it couldn't be digested and it couldn't come off and it just sat there. Okay. Now, we thought that this degradation was occurring in lysosomes because degradation required energy, binding did not require energy. Degrad if you put in a lysosomal inhibitor, such as ammonia or chloroquine, it did not affect the binding, but it blocked the degradation. So we thought hormone receptor went into the cell, hormone destroyed in the lysosome. Now, uh, 
Also being cell biologists, we wanted to see this phenomenon. We thought of three different ways, three different ways to follow the hormone. One, iodine electron microscope autoradiography. Two, put on fluorescein onto the hormone and follow it. Or three, conjugate it with ferritin and follow it. All those molecules are biologically active and they all confirmed this conclusion. I will show you a few slides from the fluorescence and the ferritin ones which gave the clearest result. Next slide. Can you lower the lights? Okay, now this is fluorescent EGF binding to cells at zero degrees. What you see is some fluorescence on the surface, mostly around the edges of the cells, and that's because you see lots of membrane. The membranes are intercalated in between them. So this is at zero degrees. You take the, then wash away the hormone, warm it up for 20 minutes at 37 degrees. Next slide. See little balls of light, presumably in the lysosomes around the nucleus and away from the outside. And if you look at these under the microscope before they fade, you can see them moving around inside, little balls of light inside the cell. Next slide. The clearest experiments are done with the ferritin. This is ferritin EGF, one to one on A431 cells. If you bind EGF ferritin to the cells, now what we think we see here are the ferritin molecules, each ferritin presumably hitched on to one EGF, hitched on to one receptor. This binding is specific. We can wipe out 99% of it by adding EGF into the medium. Now, if we take these cells, it looks more or less randomly distributed. You warm them up for 10 seconds. Next slide. You see the ferritin in little pits, most of which are coated. All right. Next slide. In two minutes, you see them in little vesicles, inside vesicles. In 15 minutes, next slide, you see the multi about 85% of the ferritin EGF that was on the surface is now in multivesicular bodies. Here you can still see little vesicles containing it. Here, multivesicular bodies. The ferritin is inside the little vesicles, but appear to be on the outside of the little vesicles that are inside the multivesicular body. Now, if you wait for one hour, next slide, you see free pools of ferritin. The ferritin is no longer hitched on to the EGF and no longer hitched on to the receptor and the membrane. And our Mickey Mouse scheme for what is happening is on the next slide. Is ferritin EGF within minutes go into vesicles. Within 15 minutes, most of it is already in the multivesicular bodies. And we believe this an inversion and budding off of the little vesicle is responsible for finding the ferritin on the outside, the little vesicles that are inside the multivesicular body. We think the ferritin and the receptor are together because the distance between the ferritin and the membrane is the same here, 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 and here. But if you wait long, Ferritin comes off, presumably the receptor and hormone are digested, and you see the iodotyrosine coming out. This is really a very rapid process. In 15 minutes, most of this is around the nucleus. Now, question, what does this mean? This happens. What is not clear is whether the internalization is part of the signaling mechanism or simply a garbage disposal mechanism for removing receptors from the surface. Okay, but clearly, they go into the cell. I prefer to think that the function of the hormone is to bring the receptor into the cell where it has a function. But that's a prejudice. <laughs>
since I could not get an unequivocal experiment for the function of internalization, we backed off and looked at it biochemically. The biochemist approach is you would like a cell-free system where you take a hormone, add it to a cell-free system, and they either speed up or slow down the reaction. This is experiments now done about 1978, the first one. The only cell-free hormone little system that I knew about with the experiments of Sutherland, where catecholamines and glucagon plus membrane activate adenyl cyclase. And we thought, well, can we do something like Sutherland did? Then I had one good thought, and that is, if we're going to look for an, a chemical reaction near the receptor, we want a cell with a lot of receptors. And people at NIH were screening all the cells in their bank for EGF receptors and had come up with a human epidermal carcinoma cell line, A431, that had two to three million receptors instead of normal 50,000. So I thought, that is the system to use. It should be 30 times easier to find a cell-free reaction, and it was. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, key experiment. You can take membranes from A431 cells. As expected, they bind a lot of EGF. The membranes also have a protein kinase present. So if you take membranes plus ATP, you get P32 incorporated into membrane proteins. If you take membranes and ATP and EGF, you get three to five times more incorporation into the membrane, a cell-free effect of a hormone. When we look in the membranes, what we were phosphorylating, next slide, please. So this is phosphorylate with increasing amounts of EGF, SDS gels, radioautography. What we see is that many bands get phosphorylated, especially a pair of bands at 150 and 170. We were interested in this band, first because it was a major band, but secondly, Doss and Fox had suggested by cross-linking experiments that the receptor for EGF had a molecular weight in this neighborhood. All right, so now we had membranes, and this is what we were phosphorylating. Then uh, we thought that the receptor and the kinase, maybe I ought to go a little bit further first and then come back. We were surprised when we found that one can triton solubilize the membrane and retain binding activity and EGF stimulated kinase activity in triton, suggesting that the receptor and the kinase and the substrate were somehow connected even in triton. So, this is a membrane experiment. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, this is triton solubilized materials. This is just total membrane protein in triton, and here we see minus and plus EGF in the phosphorylation. It still works. Right. Then, we wanted to purify the receptor. So the methodology involved making an EGF aphagel column. We took the triton extract, poured it through the column, and washed it, and you can see most of the proteins came through. And some of the kinase came through also. Then we wanted to see what was left on the EGF aphagel column. So the first thing we tried to elute with was, of course, EGF itself. So when we elute with EGF, this is the EGF. And all we saw was one major protein at 150,000. After we eluted it, you can do the phosphorylation. And here it is. It gets phosphorylated. Since you could not do a plus-minus EGF experiment, because we eluded with EGF, by trial and error we found we could elute with ethanolamine, and then you can do a minus and plus EGF. So here, this band, we concluded, was the receptor. That's how it was isolated. It was also the substrate for the kinase. We didn't quite know where the kinase was. 
You also see a 150, 170 band. Next slide, please. Okay, this is sort of a summary slide. We now believe that the receptor is really 170,000 molecule. That the 150 is a proteolytic degradation product due to the presence of calcium activated protease. So you can isolate it as a 150, Kumasi blue, or as a 170 if you leave out calcium. At both kinases, the 170 autophosphorylates better, and you can cross link it. They are both receptors, you can cross link with iodinated EGF. This is a BSA artifact. So we think the native receptor is a 170 molecule. Next slide, please. Okay, now very quickly. Uh, I thought our receptor might have something to do with PP60 SARC, the transforming protein of Rau sarcoma virus, because they are membrane associated kinases, cyclic AMP independent, somehow connected with cell growth and somehow connected with cell ruffling. When Tony Hunter discovered that PP60 SARC only phosphorylated tyrosine, and that was the first tyrosine kinase discovered, thought specific for transforming protein. We looked in our system immediately, and this is amino acid hydrolysis of a phosphorylated membrane, plus CGF, minus CGF, phosphoserine, phosphothreonine, clearly phosphotyrosine. Next experiment. Do we have a contamination of PP60 in our cells? The way to look at that, as you know, you take antibodies to PP60, antibody to PP60, precipitate PP60, and get phosphorylated on tyrosine. Those specific antibodies. Next slide. Answer. Antibodies, our receptor can phosphorylate PP60 SARC antibodies on tyrosine in an EGF dependent way. But the antibodies do not precipitate the receptor. It is a separate kinase. These antibodies are simply good substrates for tyrosine kinases. Now, to be known in general, presumably there's a slight affinity, not enough to bring it down with protein A. So we did not have PP60 in our preps. Then the question was, where is our kinase? Okay, next slide. We thought at first that the kinase was separate from the receptor because we could heat inactivate the kinase much more readily than we heat inactivate the receptor. So we thought there were two molecules. But all our experiments pointed towards one. And this is the one, some few of the experiments. One, in a native gel, you see a Kumasi blue little smear. You can take that gel and incubate the gel after electrophoresis with ATP minus EGF plus EGF and do the reaction in the gel. And you can see there's an EGF effect. So that indicates that the kinase is in this smear, the receptor is in this smear, and the substrate are in this smear. Right? Now, we can keep purifying, but the difficulty is we're in triton, and maybe we're just purifying micelles and not proteins. So we thought, could we affinity label the kinase part and see if it ended up in the receptor? <coughs> Next slide. Okay, we used FSBA, the Coleman reagent, ATP binding sites, radioactive. Next slide. When you incubate membranes with this labeled reagent, it kills the kinase and radioactivity gets incorporated into the membrane. Then you take that labeled membrane and do SDS gels. Next slide. And you can see the 170, 150 band get labeled with the ATP reagent. If you kill the kinase with a little heat or enethylamide, no binding. The labeling of the receptor is specific. 
in that next line. You can block it with a non-hydrolyzable ATP analog, AMP, PNP. So clearly, we're blocking an ATP binding site. Okay, our final conclusion from all these experiments, next slide, okay, is our, again, Mickey Mouse model, was that the receptor was a transmembrane glycoprotein right, with two separate domains, one accessible to the outside, to the hormone, one on the inside with kinase activity, a little extra little piece that gets chopped off by the kinase, by the uh, calcium activated protease that has tyrosine sites. But somehow the two have to be connected in some way because how does binding the hormone to the ax outside activate the kinase on the inside? It activates it for autophosphorylation or for the phosphorylation of a number of exogenous substrates. Okay, can I see the next slide, please? I think we're up to the time of the era of the molecular biologists. And right, now I want to go through a few of the very key data from many laboratories throughout the world, the cloners. Right, now, EGF receptor has been cloned. It looks like roughly a 1,200 amino acid peptide, about half outside the membrane, half inside the membrane, with about a 25 hydrophobic amino acid stretch. Just one has been detected. About 10 to 11 glycosylation sites are seen. It is two regions very high in cysteines. Now, on the inside of the membrane is first area which is very homologous to PP60 SARC, tyrosine kinase, and Abelson virus. This is the tyrosine and PP60 SARC. It gets phosphorylated. Here is the binding site for the FSBA on lysine 721. It's done in our laboratory. This is the lysine 721 ATP binding site. There is a threonine just on the inside of the membrane that's phosphorylated by protein kinase C. It seems to regulate something in an unknown way. Here are those tyrosine, major tyrosine phosphorylation sites. It is utterly unclear at this moment how binding of EGF to the outside, if there's only one transmembrane region, activates the kinase on the inside. Many suppositions. Maybe there's aggregation. Maybe there's more than one transmembrane region. That's where that stands. Now, as you know now, the same laboratories discovered that the transforming gene of erythroblastosis virus, VRB, is approximately 90% homologous with the inside part of the EGF receptor. It is lacking an EGF binding site. So presumably, erythroblastosis virus has acquired a portion of the chicken EGF receptor. Okay? Now, a little bit more data. Next slide, please. Just going very quickly. Essence. There's EGF on top human EGF, a group of EGF-like pep peptides that sit on the same receptor as EGF. They've been called TGFs. There's a sequence in vaccinia virus that looks like EGF, and not on this. There's a sequence in Drosophila and a sequence in roundworms having to do with development that look like EGF. So EGF must be of quite ancient origin and may serve many functions in nature. Next slide more cloners. Pre-pro-EGF. EGF itself is a 53 amino acid peptide. Pre-pro-EGF is about, again, a 1,200 amino acid molecule that might even be a membrane, transmembrane protein with the EGF on the outside and six other EGF-like sequences of totally unknown function. 
That looks very interesting. Nobody understands that yet. Nobody understands the results of Brown and Goldstein, who spoke last year, showing that part of the LDL receptor is homologous to the pre-pro-EGF. So as far as I'm aware, nobody has made any sense out of that either. Okay, can I see what the next slide is? Okay, I think what I will do is simply not show any more. I might show the last slide. I just tell you what we're thinking about. Here now what we have, certain transforming proteins of tyrosine kinases, EGF receptors of tyrosine kinase, insulin receptors of tyrosine kinase, platelet-derived growth factors of tyrosine kinase, and probably there will be more of them. They all can't do the same thing. Right? So where does the specificity lie? In the kinase or where the kinase is located? How does the signal get from the membrane to the nucleus? We don't know. Two approaches that we've taken, one is the possibility that when EGF brings the kinase receptor into the cell, it brings it in because it is a kinase, and these little vesicles that move around in the cell may have tyrosine kinase and can phosphorylate things inside the cell, maybe even the nucleus. No evidence. We do have evidence that the little vesicles that are floating around in the cell are active as tyrosine kinases. That's as far as that goes. They are active. So that hypothesis is still viable, that the function is to bring it in. The other approach that many people have taken is to hunt for substrates for the tyrosine kinase. We, too, have hunted a substrate and isolated our own substrate. It is a 35K protein with certain properties. It, has a cal it is a calcium-binding protein, and in the presence of calcium, it sticks to membranes and can be phosphorylated on tyrosine in the EGF-dependent way. Right? I can say I believe true in general for None of the substrates that have been isolated in many laboratories does anybody really know what they do or what is the result of tyrosine phosphorylation. The substance that we, the 35K protein that we isolated, we isolated first from A431 cells and then we have isolated from normal slaughterhouse material. It is high in lungs and placenta. And we sequenced the first 30 amino acids, hoping that we could learn its identity in some way. Here we have an unknown protein. And uh, when we got that first 30 amino acids, we went to the data bank, and there was no data for it. So that didn't help us any. But about four or five months ago, Barbara Walner and Biogen Laboratory got a cDNA sequence for a molecule they called lipocortin. Lipocortin is supposed to be a steroid-induced phospholipase A2 inhibitor, published in Nature. Since I look at all sequences even close to 35K, I looked at that sequence, and lo and behold, it was pretty close. So can I have the, just show me the last slide, please. Okay, the top line is the Walner cDNA, the deduced amino acid sequence, starting with 1 going to 13 in the two rows. And this is number one amino acid of R35K protein. If you go right down the line, you will see there are only four differences, and they're conserved between the lipocortin human cDNA and our pig lung molecule. So, what does this mean? I think that's all for the lights. So, if they have cloned lipocortin, that is the molecule that we have. Here's a problem. The things that are known about lipocortin is, first, it binds phospholipids in the presence of calcium. It will bind membranes in the presence of calcium. 
It will bind actin in the presence of calcium. It will inhibit, and both molecules inhibit phospholipase A2 activity when you do assays in the test tube. The difficulty is we are not at all sure what the true physiological function of this molecule is and what the role of tyrosine phosphorylation. It is a very good substrate in the test tube. It is a very good substrate when you do P32 labeling inside cells and then precipitate the 35K with the antibody, and I'm not showing that. So, in essence, that's where we are. What is unknown in all the systems, so far as I can see, is what is the next step after tyrosine phosphorylation that we believe is important? How does the signal get to the nucleus to tell the nucleus to start transcribing MYC, FOS, or anything else? As far as I see, that is totally unknown, and I think that's what we're trying to aim at now. Thank you.